uh, speaker and the chair for for today's meeting will be will be Dr. Edmund Stewart. So I will be I will turn off my camera and, and microphone and I give give the floor to to Edmund. Thanks, Matthews. Um, we seem to um, not have uh, uh, Edward Harris with us just at the moment, unless I can't see him on the. If if you if you are there, Edward, please do make, let me know. Um, do you know he 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 is? Um, uh, um, I, I know he's he he should be signing in, but you haven't received any email uh, saying he has no. been having difficulties. I, I I don't see him. Uh, yes, he's joining us. Okay. Ah, oh, good. Hi there, Edmund. Can you hear me? Hello. Yes. We well, can Professor hear you. Harris has joined us, and so I'll leave it to Edmund to introduce our 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 speaker today. Good evening, Professor Harris, and yeah, please, Edmund. Hello, everyone. Um, well, it's Hi. great to see. Uh, so many of you uh, are returning for the second uh, talk. I'm glad I didn't frighten too many people away, uh, because as I say, uh, said at the time uh, in, in the first lecture, um, we really do have a superb lineup of, of very interesting speakers. Uh, and um, here uh, we I'm going to introduce the first of uh, that uh, subsequent lineup. Um, so uh, Professor Harris, uh, I'm sure uh, many of you who are uh, experts in um, uh, ancient Greek history, um, of which I can see a few uh, in the in the room, um, will know uh, Professor Harris's work. Um, now I'm going to do a little bit of um, uh, publicity um, to show some of his his latest publications um, in uh, the field, particularly of the ancient economy and the volume the ancient Greek economy. And also, most recently, this particular uh, volume, um, which uh, is a shameless piece of self-publicity as well, because I was also one of the uh, editors, uh, along with uh, Edward, uh, on that volume, and also David uh, Lewis. Um, but of course, um, Edward's also known for uh, his work on the rule of law in classical Athens, and I don't have to go through those publications with you because they're handily listed on the handout, which I hope everyone has, or maybe, uh, Matthew, is it possible to, to put it in the chat, um, if, if you could, um, or maybe I will. Pardon me, what, what, what do you want me to put in the chat? The handout, the hand is it possible to put it uh, in the I, I could do it, but I'm not sure if everyone will be able to to see it but uh, i'll do it anyway I, I sent it via email hopefully everyone has it um but anyway um so um what we are uh, the topic of uh this evening's talk is the rule of law and particularly the rule of law not so much in democratic athens but in tyrannies and without further ado i shall shut up and leave the uh floor to edward thank you very much for joining us OK, great. I'm trying to get a kind of full screen. This is a different Microsoft's team is a different program for me, and I'm trying to figure out where to put the um, where to put the full screen, actually. Hold on just a second. Well, that's OK. I can. I, is everybody can everyone hear me? Can you hear yeah, me? Yes, I hear you. If you yeah. want to share your screen, it's the yeah. uh, button with the arrow in it on the, the bar. Um, See so the there's. Bar. There's a bar and there's a there's a square with an arrow in it. Yeah, yeah, I see that. And then and you, what do I hit once I'm down there? So you click that and it'll come up with. Uh, so you can uh, then um, uh, choose to share your whole desktop window or a particular file or page. See, I see window. I see window, but I don't see. Wait a minute. It's not getting me full screen, actually. Well, if you. If you click on uh, desktop window, that should share your screen with us. Desktop window? Let's see. Yeah. Mm. 
yeah so if you just put up your powerpoint or your uh whatever you i don't have a, I, I i don't have a powerpoint i just have the uh i just have the handout which i uh again uh i hope has been distributed to everybody but i'm going to be referring to the powerpoint oh. and um okay i just wish i could kind of get the full screen wait a minute no i can't get that you say uh, it so no again you see me you can see me now okay good yeah uh, so, so sorry edward if you don't want to if you don't have anything to put Talking, I'll be translating the passages, and the uh, passages uh, are, are, to a certain extent are just kind of convenience. Um, after um, the talk, uh, people hopefully um, will find this um, kind of useful. Okay, good. Okay, so, let me start. Sorry, yep. sorry, sorry to interrupt you again. So, if you could just um, close the stop sh sharing your screen. Um, Where is that? Because, because at the moment, everyone can just see me. Um, where do uh, I hit that? Um, uh, the problem is I can't. <laughs> uh, it there should be a yes. That that's probably it. Yeah, there we go. There you go. No, no, Sorry, I hit, I hit we're ready. Right Sorry, excuse me. That but that didn't really. That wasn't very helpful. No, um, that's okay. Right. That's we're, okay. We're all fine now. It just that I. I, I've done these things on kind of three different programs, and I'm not quite this one. I'm uh, Microsoft Teams. I'm not used to. Okay, good. Um, thank you very much, uh, Edmund. Uh, I'd like to begin uh, by thanking Edmund Stewart for organizing this series of lectures on tyranny, and also for uh, Professor Straczynski uh, and the University of Poznan for sponsoring uh, this series and for uh, this kind invitation. The topic of tyranny is a very timely one. For 50 years, Freedom House has published an annual a report entitled uh, Freedom in the World. In 2021, however, the report was more pessimistic than usual and was given the title Democracy Under Siege. The Biden administration has responded to these concerns by organizing a two-day online conference on December 9th and 10th to discuss three themes. One, discussing defending against authoritarianism, fighting corruption, and promoting respect for human rights. And I do not have to remind our Polish colleagues about the threat to freedom and democracy and the rule of law from their neighbor to the East, President Alexander Lukashenko. And it is appropriate that I'm giving this talk on the 17th of November, the anniversary of the day in 1973, when the Greek junta sent tanks into the Polytechnic University of Athens to suppress pro-democracy protests and uh, when many students and other civilians were killed. In fact, actually from my apartment here in Athens, uh, I've been able to hear uh, the protests marching to the American embassy. Um, uh, and the American embassy, uh, unfortunately, um, because during the junta, um, there was a considerable support actually uh, for uh, the government at the time. In fact, pro, uh, the uh, pri vice president uh, at the time, uh, Spiro Agnew, uh, said that uh, the Greek junta uh, was the best uh, form of Greek uh, government, actually, uh, since the uh, reign of Pericles. And I do not have, um, and it's appropriate that I'm giving, um, again, the nature of tyranny and its threat to democracy and the rule of law is a pressing concern in all parts of the world today. But there's been very little discussion, to my knowledge, and I urge those in the audience to correct me if I'm wrong, about the origin of this concept by modern political scientists, uh, with the exception of Leo Strauss, as Edmund Stewart uh, mentioned in his first lecture. Now, there could be no question that the words tyrannos, tyrant, and tyrannos, tyranny, are first found in ancient Greek literature. The word may originate in the Lydian language, but the negative connotations and the analysis of the phenomenon are purely Greek. The earliest known attestation comes from the poet Archilochus, I do not care about the wealth of Gyges, rich in gold, and I am not jealous of him at all, and nor do I envy the works of the gods, nor do I desire a great tyranny, for these things are far from my sight, literally from my eyes. Then, in the early 6th century, Solon uses the term to describe a rule of law, a uh, type of rule, he rejects and associates tyranny with slavery and suffering. 
Around the time, uh, same time, Alcius calls his enemy Patalicus a tyrant, a term which is clearly not a compliment. And as Edmund pointed out in his lecture, and I, here I fully agree with him, there was hostility to tyranny in the early 6th century and probably also as early as the late 7th century when Chilon and his followers attempted to set up a tyranny and were violently suppressed. But what does this term come to be used? Why does this term come to be used in this period? In the past, scholars have assumed that tyranny represented a new form of rule and a departure from previous political arrangements. Some have claimed that the tyrants drew on popular support to overthrow entrenched elites who ruled through their control of gene and fratries, uh, type of kinship organizations, which dominated political life in the early archaic period. In the early 1970s, however, two important works by Félix Bourriot and Denis Roussel show that this description of political organization during the archaic period is quite, quite untenable. And we will see that political power was obtained and exercised in a very different way in the Homeric poems. In an important article, the late George Cockwell also challenged the view that tyrants drew mainly on popular support. In this talk, I want to take a very different approach, which is based partly on an essay I published in 2006 and on a Durham uh, 2017 Durham doctoral thesis uh, by my student James Taylor. An article summarizing his analysis is forthcoming in a volume about archaic Greece to be edited by Mirko Cannavaro and Johannes Bernhard. Now, it's important to, by out, uh, to start by outlining the ways in which leaders gained and maintained power in the period of the Homeric and Hesiodic poems, that is, in the late 8th century and the early 7th century BCE. This is not the place to discuss the historicity of these poems. Suffice it to say that work on oral traditions has revealed that the poems either composed, poems composed orally or coming out of an oral tradition show their characters acting in accordance with contemporary values and social practices. Oral traditions do not preserve the memory of social practices no longer familiar to their audiences. Now, after describing these practices and the concepts of freedom and slavery, I will contrast these practices with those that, of the city-states following eunomia, or the rule of law, in the 6th and 7th centuries, the 6th and 5th centuries, excuse me. Next, I will look at the poetry of Solon, who provides the ideological justification behind these practices, which are to prevent the concentration of power in the hands of one man, that is, tyranny, which violates the rights of members of the community and the new meaning of the terms freedom and slavery. Right, here, I will be uh, especially challenging uh, the work of uh, Kurt Rafflaub. I will then show that the leaders who were called tyrants in the sixth century do not introduce a new way of ruling, but gain and maintain power by traditional methods, and those attested in the Homeric poems. The concept of tyranny was therefore invented as an ideological construct to demonize traditional ways of gaining power and to discourage citizens from returning to these old ways. This led to the creation of the stereotype of the tyrant, which can be seen in the history of Herodotus and also in Attic tragedy. This stereotype was also a powerful political weapon, which could be used by leaders against their opponents, for instance, against Alcibiades and his associates in 415, and also by communities against their foreign enemies, for instance, by the Spartans against the Athenians, and then later by the Athenians against the Spartans after the Corinthian War, and finally by Demosthenes against Philip in the 340s. Now, we begin, and it's important, with the traditional means of gaining power in Homeric society. If you have the handout, uh, I've given you a list of these. First of all, leaders in Homeric society needed to have land and slaves to work the land to produce a surplus. The old view was that slavery was not important in the period of Homer and Hesiod, but this is contradicted by the evidence of the poems. Uh, as I've demonstrated in an article published in 2012, and David Lewis uh, in his book of 2018 is demonstrated at great length. All the leaders of the epics have many slaves. Odysseus has 50 uh, female slaves and many more slaves tending flocks in the countryside. Eumaeus is one of dozens. And Agamemnon has many slaves, in fact, can give many away without causing a dent in his actual holdings. Priam clearly has many slaves, and so does Alcinous. Fifty women alone, obviously many more uh, men. 
We will discuss the difference between free and slave later. Two, it's important in the Homeric poems to gain leadership in the community by defending the community and to gain slaves by going on raids abroad. And there are the famous passage, of course, by Glaucon, who says that the people honor them with privileges because they fight in the front ranks. In Homeric fighting, there is no fixed position. Each warrior advances by himself, often in single combat to pro prove his valor. And this is a key way that leaders in the Homeric world actually prove their title to rule in their communities. Three, religion. The leader of the community uh, also organizes feasts and games to honor the gods and to maintain good relations with the community. And sacrifices require large herds and slaves are needed to tend these herds and festivals require prizes to distribute. Uh, it's a very good example of this is Achilles again in book 23 of the Iliad uh, shows his uh, title to kind of lead actually by distributing prizes in a just actually fashion. This is also seen by Alcinous in uh, the uh, Odyssey. Four, each leader has a band of uh, a tyroid, his personal companions who follow him into battle. Odysseus has his tyroid who follow him to Troy and back. And this is a personal tie between the leader and each companion and can it be emotionally very, very deep, as we see in the relationship, for instance, between Patroclus and Achilles. Five, the importance of having a Xenoi. Uh, this is a foreign friends. This is the guest host relationship. One gains allies outside the community and is accompanied by rituals protected by Zeus Xenios, the god of the guest host relationship. Uh, as we see, for instance, in the very beginning of the Odyssey, the guests arrive at the house um, and is protected there. When he departs, the ghost, the host gives him a guest gift, a token to remember the tie, and a way of creating an obligation which the guest will reciprocate in the future. And Xenoi are very important because they can be summoned on military expeditions and also can be summoned to defend the community. Again, we see the importance also of having a surplus. The guest host relationship does not exist unless the leaders have a surplus, which they can then uh, distribute uh, to their guests to create ties not outside the community. Number six, marriage ties are very important. Marriage ties can create bonds between leaders both inside and outside the community. Leaders give their daughters to other powerful men, and there is need again here for money, again created by slave labor, to provide dowries. Priam is probably the best practitioner of marriage diplomacy with his 50 wives, but these also provide children who can help to maintain his power. Seven, because they protect the community against outsiders, leaders can demand payments from their followers, which serve to increase their wealth. Uh, there are several uh, examples of this. Uh, and for instance, Alcinous demands uh, payments and actually um, from uh, people in the community uh, to compensate him for the uh, prizes he's giving to the gifts he's giving to uh, Odysseus. And we have several other examples uh, of this uh, where the leaders of the community, again, because of the services they give to them, also will gain these uh, what I would call kind of protection money. Uh, which also in help to increase their wealth. Eight, leaders can also gain prestige by the fair resolution of disputes. When they do not resolve disputes fairly, as we see in the case of Hesiod, they lose legitimacy in the eyes of the community. So these are eight more or less means of creating uh, power uh, in, the Homeric, uh, in the Homeric world. All these ties are personal. There is no separation between the person and the office as there is in later periods. Because power is a personal possession, it's been given to another person. For instance, when Agamemnon offers compensation to Achilles for taking Perseus, he offers him several towns which will give him gifts. Again, this kind of protection money. Agamemnon regards his power over these communities as his personal property, which he can give to Achilles without the consent of the people in these communities. And the leader can pass on his power to his descendants. When Agamemnon is killed by Aegisthus, Orestes 
claims power in Argos by the right of inheritance, not by a vote of the people. And the power of Agamemnon and Argos and Odysseus and Ithaca is not limited in time. It lasts as long as no one takes it away from them by force. Now, already in this period, there is a strict distinction between free and slave. But these are words attached to individuals and not to communities. And the terms freedom and slavery are not used to characterize the relationship between leaders and followers. In Homer and Hesiod, individuals are either free or slaves, but communities are never called free or slave. Rothlau, following Moses Finley, believed that there was a spectrum of statuses in Homeric society and that slaves were not the lowest rung of the status ladder because they were at least attached to powerful households. But the words of Hector to Andromache in Book Six of the Iliad show that slavery was not just another status along a uh, spectrum, but it was the very antithesis of freedom for the individual, and that is that it was something to be dreaded and to be avoided at all costs. Uh, I want to read this passage because I think it's very important, and it's going also going to be very important for our kind of understanding of the evolution uh, of the idea of uh, a tyranny. Uh, so I, I'm taking um, those of you who have the handout can kind of follow along. I've given you the English uh, translation of uh, Lattimore plus the Greek texts. For I know this thing well in my heart, says Hector, and in my mind knows it. There will come a day when sacred aliens shall perish and Priam and the people of Priam, with the strong ash spear. But it's not so much the pain to come of the Trojans that troubles me, not even of Priam the king nor Hecabe, not the thought of my brothers who in their numbers and valors shall drop in the dust under the hands of men who hate them. As trouble me the thought of you when some bronze or armored Achaean leads you off, taking away your day of liberty. And this is very interesting because here we have the word Eleutheron. Uh, obviously the concept of liberty is already there in the Iliad, in tears. And in Argos, you must work at the loom of another and carry water from the spring of Messias or Riperea, all unwilling, it's a very important term, akon, and, but strong will be the necessity upon you. And someday, seeing you shedding tears, a man will say of you, quote, this is the wife of Hector, who was ever the fightest, bravest, bravest fighter of the Trojans, breaker of horses in the days when they fought about Ilion. So will one speak of you, and for you it will be a yet a fresh grief, to be widowed of a, such a man who could fight off the day of your slavery. So there's a very firm contrast between Eleftheria and also Dulia, slavery. But may I be dead and piled earth, hide me under, before I hear you crying and know by this that they drag you captive. Now, there's several important aspects to observe. First, there's a stark distinction between freedom and slavery or the day of freedom and the day of slavery. Slavery is not just another rung on the ladder of social statuses, Pacharaflo. It is radically different mode of existence. Secondly, slavery is associated with being passive instead of active. Free persons can make decisions about their lives. The slave is dragged away. The relationship between master and slave is one of physical force. This makes the relationship different from that between free people of different statuses. Free people should use persuasion by words to convince each other and gain consent. Third, free people work for themselves and their families. Slaves work for another. Andromache will not work at her own loom, but at the loom of another. Uh, the words are very carefully chosen by the poet. Fourth, Andromache will perform her tasks against her will and not as she wishes. Uh, fifth, she will be subject to ananke, that is the necessity, which implies the absence of choice. Fifth, this condition is filled with pain and sorrow, and Dramaki will be weeping and crying. Contrary to Rothlaub's assumption, Hector and the Greeks of this period clearly understood the stark differences between freedom and slavery and considered slavery as something to be avoided, but it was a condition for individuals and not for communities. I'm going to return to this point because it's going to be very important when we talk about Solon. Okay, between the period of the Homeric and Hesiodic poems, roughly 700 BCE, 650 BCE at the latest, 
there arises a new set of political practices, which are very different from those in the Homeric and Hesionic poems. These de develop at different rhythms in different communities, but by the Persian Wars, they are widespread throughout the Greek world. And it's best to describe these different practices first, and then seek out the rationale behind them. Okay, first, and I've listed these uh, on the handout. Uh, I've not given you uh, references. If you want to get uh, references to uh, specific uh, inscriptions, uh, I would uh, suggest uh, looking at my article of 2006. First, there's a division of functions among different officials. The Greek city-states divide governments into three basic parts. One, the deliberative function carried out by the council and the assembly, which makes general decisions about the community, such as passing laws and decrees. Second, making, uh, making decisions about peace and war and allocating public funds. Second, the judicial function, which is clearly differentiated from the deliberative function. And this dispenses justice to individuals according to the laws. And the third part, is magistrates who carry out the decisions of the deliberative bodies in accordance with the laws. Uh, what's interesting here, there's a, even in the archaic period, late archaic period, we have a strong sense of division of functions. Uh, it's a little different, again, from the classic kind of uh, division uh, of uh, functions, uh, say, as uh, shown by uh, Montesquieu, uh, but nevertheless, there is a definite sense that different bodies have different uh, uh, functions. Uh, the main reason is, of course, is because the Greeks have a direct democracy as opposed to uh, direct, uh, well, direct uh, democracy as opposed to representative institutions. Uh, I've discussed this elsewhere. Um, if anyone's interested, we can uh, talk about it. Two, officials are given specific and separate jurisdictions. At Athens under Solon, their treasurers to control public funds, the Archon, the Polemarch, who at first was the leader of the army, and the Basileus, who received charges of homicide, and also the Naukroi, who appear to have had control for money for the fleet. At Sparta, there in the 6th century, the two kings who lead the army when abroad, and the council, which deliberates about policy, the assembly, which makes decisions about major issues, making peace and going to war, and then also the five ephors, who are responsible for policing, and for judging private cases. So we have this kind of, again, division of functions among different uh, bodies and also magistrates. Three, one set of officials can act as a check on another set of officials. One of the earliest laws recorded on stones comes from Olympia in the sixth century and grants certain privileges to the Theokolos, a religious official, but forbids him to appropriate goods belonging to the god. If he violates this rule, he is to be judged by another official called the Eromaros. A law from Lithos and Crete dated to around 500 BCE forbids officials called the Cosmoi to receive foreigners except in certain cases. If they do, they are to be tried before judges. Another early law on stone from Tiryns near Argos in the Peloponnese. This law instructs officials called the Platino Warkai to find another set of officials called the Platinoi, excuse my Greek pronunciation, 30 minoi for some offense. At Sparta, the ephors also had the power to remove from office any official who was not obeying the law. So it's not only that we have a, a whole set of different officials with different ju jurisdictions, one set of officials can act as a check on another set of officials. Fourth, an important way to prevent the tradition, uh, concentration of power was to forbid magistrates to hold office for more than one year at a time. Already before Solon, the Archon served for only a year, and by the fifth century, all major offices were held for only a year, except for the generals who could be reelected. But generals at Athens did not receive extended terms. They had to be reelected every year. So in a way, they're the exception which uh, proves the rule. One of the earliest laws preserved on stone comes from the city, Cretan city of Dreros, and is dated to between 650 to 600 BCE, and states that if a man holds the office of cosmos, he should not be cosmos again for another 10 years. A sixth century law from uh, Gorton requires that the same man must not hold the office again for another three years, the office of Gnomon for another 10 years, and the office of cosmos for foreigners for another five years. At Sparta, ephors were elected for a year at a time. In the fifth century, the Spartans elected a leader 
of the fleet called a Navar, but allowed him to serve only for a year at a time. And this, it's interesting, uh, this created a problem during the Peloponnesian War after Lysander, who was a very, very uh, a successful uh, commander, uh, was forced to stop actually after a year. And the Spartans kind of came up uh, with a very clever way of kind of getting around that law. But it was very interesting that Again, uh, this principle uh, was still uh, very important. Five, one of the most striking features of early Greek laws is the number of penalties laid down for officials who do not uphold the law. I'm not going to go into uh, give a list of this. I've given a list of these uh, in my article of 2006. Um, But the thing that's really quite remarkable Uh, is also how this comes from all different parts uh, of the Greek world, uh, really stressing from the Peloponnese to central Greece uh, to Asia Minor. Uh, One common thing was that if officials do not uh, impose a fine uh, for violations of the law, they themselves are responsible for paying uh, this uh, fine and and will be held uh, responsible. Uh, this is a principle which is first uh, we find first in the uh, archaic period, and then is uh, we find these uh, similar types of phrases uh, in inscriptions going down for the classical period all the way to the Hellenistic period. Now, this is a very important principle: the idea of the accountability of officials, uh, which has been studied uh, in an excellent book uh, by uh, Pierre Feulich, Le Contrôle des Magistrats. Uh, Not as well known, actually, I must say, uh, in British uh, and American um, academia, uh, but is a very important uh, work which shows that this idea of the accountability of officials, which starts very early, was something which continues on down into the classical uh, Hellenistic period and is widespread throughout the entire Greek world. Six, another important way of preventing the concentration of power was to assign a, a, a task not to a single official, but to boards of magistrates. At the time of Solon, there are several trusted boards of Basileis, Thesmothetai, Naukroroi, uh, Poletai, pre- uh, treasurers, and Kolokretai. By the 5th century, there's a proliferation of boards of officials, 10 generals, 10 treasurers of, Athen- of, of Athena, 10 treasurers of the other gods, 10 logistai, 10 helenomatuiae, and 11 in charge of the prison, and others, and uh, one, which one can find in the constitution of the Athenians attributed to Aristotle. Uh, this is not an Athenian peculiarity. In an essay published in 2006, I found evidence for boards of officials in many Greek polis before 400 BCE, if not before 500 BCE, including Amorgos, Arcadia, Argos, Halion in Locris, Chios, Dreros, Eretria, Gorton, Halicarnassus, Lindos on Rhodes, Miletus, Naupactus, Olympia, Teos, and Thassos. So this is a widespread phenomenon, and it's very important, again, for uh, Greek ideas. Uh, Lena Rubinstein has collected some of the evidence for these boards during the classical and Hellenistic periods when it remained a widespread practice. Seven, to ensure that laws would uh, would rule and that not individuals who could alter the laws of the community, but to suit their personal advantage, the Greeks often attached entrenchment clauses to their statutes to provide for stability and predictability. And these are two key features of the rule of law. Uh, these uh, clauses have been uh, collected. Uh, uh, Professor Rhodes, the late Professor Rhodes, um, uh, had uh, some uh, collected some of them in his uh, important work, uh, The Decrees of the Greek State, but published in 1997. Uh, they were discussed also by uh, James Sickinger uh, and also by Lehman Rubenstein uh, in a, a Symposium 2007. They're very important. It would be very useful, I must say, if there are any graduate students there in the audience, uh, a complete collection of these uh, entrenchment clauses, uh, I must say, is still a desideratum, desideratum. But they are very important. They be, But the important thing is they begin in the late archaic period and they continue down. And they're also something which is characteristic both of Athens and also to a certain extent of uh, Sparta and also non-democratic regimes, and they continue on down in the Hellenistic period. Now, the aim of this system is to avoid the concentration of power, which is tyranny. This is the best way to respect the freedom of the free, that is their individual rights. And 
if I may be uh, allowed uh, a personal kind of comment, uh, I found that in much work uh, recently, uh, and actually this goes back, that the Greeks did really not have a sense of a protection of individual rights. Uh, and that they were really interested in the power uh, of the people, and this was the main kind of struggle. Uh, I don't think this is a correct view. I think the Greeks were very interested in the individual rights of citizens, uh, again, in some cases of free foreigners, uh, and that, yes, it's very true that the Greeks uh, recognized and accepted slavery, but that is not to say that they did not recognize and much to protect and place actually, I would say at the center of their constitution, a respect for the rights of individual free uh, citizens. Now it was also the best way to avoid slavery for the members of the community. In his poetry, Solon eloquently explains the rationale behind the new system. Um, now, uh, again, I've given you uh, several passages again uh, on the handout. Now, what's really important here is the words of Leptherios, freedom and free, the words Dulea, gain a new meaning in the poetry of, of Solon, which is very important for the development of political ideas in European thought and for the concept of tyranny, uh, to come back to our theme. This concept is taken over in Roman political thought and is developed further in the Italian Renaissance. And in the Homeric poems, these words, Eleftheros and Dulos, are used for individuals, not for communities, or for the relationship between leaders and the members of the community. Achilles, Agamemnon, Odysseus, and Priam are all free people, but the community of Ithaca is never called free, and the people of Sparta or Troy are free individuals, but not free as a collective body. Solon changes this, and this is a major change. Uh, again, uh, another uh, digression here. It's very interesting that in some recent works about uh, Greek political thought, uh, it tends to begin kind of in the history of Greek political thought begins in the fifth century. Uh, and for instance, uh, Professor Ober, who you're going to hear later, doesn't think that the Athenian democracy was kind of supported by any kind of ideology or kind of political thought. And in several works, uh, we hear that political thought is something that begins with a sophist. It's developed in Plato and Aristotle. I think this is fundamentally mistaken. And uh, in the question period, there may be some people who challenge, this, challenge me. Uh, Solon is a political thinker, and he has some very important political ideas which have a huge effect on the shape of Greek political ideas in the next um, several uh, centuries. Um, now, first of all, Solon associates the rule of one man with the slavery in Fragment 9 West and mentions the demos as a collective body falling into slavery. In Homer, the rule of one man is seen as best and as necessary. Uh, when Odysseus actually says in Book 2, it's best for there not to be many leaders but to be one leader. Uh, here we have the opposite. Uh, and here, the rule of one man is slavery, that is, the relationship between the ruler and members of the community is compared as a political metaphor to the relationship between master and slave. He therefore reveals the rationale behind these measures is to avoid the concentration of power. In fragment 32, he declares that he has rejected tyranny for himself to avoid shaming his reputation with Kleos. In the Homeric world, the way to gain Kleos is to gain as much power as possible. Here, Solon gains Kleos by rejecting absolute power. The way to do this is to distribute power between parts of the community to achieve a balance. Tyranny is also associated with violence, which is implacable, implacable as opposed to uh, willing obedience. In fragment five, Solon characterizes the best relationship between leaders and followers as a combination of freedom and compulsion. Just as the improper relationship between leaders and citizens was compared to slavery, here, the proper relationship between leaders and citizens involves some compulsion, as is inevitable, but is also associated by contrast with freedom. Solon has taken the terms that were used to describe personal relationships between individuals and applied them to the relationship between officials and citizens. 
This proper relationship is achieved by creating a balance between parts of the community, as in shown in fragment five of Solon. The aim of the new system is to protect the rights of each section of the community without allowing either to violate the rights of the other. In a famous fragment 36, Solon summarizes his achievements and declares that he has made the land as a, the land as a whole free, which was once enslaved. Again, another very innovative use of the terms for slavery and freedom. Under the rule of law or eunomia, a term which Solon also used but also transforms, which he has established, the land as a whole is free and individuals in the community are rescued from slavery. Rothlaub has claimed that the idea of political freedom does not emerge until the Persian Wars and is introduced to express the idea of the freedom of the community from foreign dom domination. These passages of Solon show that freedom as a political slogan is first used to contrast the rule of law and the relationship between rulers and citizens a century before the Persian Wars. And the verb eleutheró, that is to free, would later be used when describing liberation, liberation of Athens by the Spartans from the tyranny of the Pisistratids. We also see the association of freedom and deliverance from tyranny after the uh, overthrow of Polycrates when My Myandrius erects an altar to Zeus Eleutherios. Rothlaut tries desperately to eliminate this piece of evidence, which really to a certain extent, is one of the main pieces of evidence actually against his whole kind of view of the kind of evolution of kind of Greek um, of freedom. But it's clear that the title Zeus was written on the altar uh, in which Herodotus later saw. So it's obviously a piece of evidence from the sixth, late sixth century. This should come as no surprise because as we've seen in the association of freedom, the rule of law and the deliverance of tyranny was already there in Solon. Now, this association between freedom and the rule of law would later prove to be very long lasting. I could provide many passages, but I've selected the, just the one from Hyperides' funeral oration at the end of the classical period. And that's the last thing uh, I think uh, on the handout. Okay, so we have a very uh, a set of practices uh, which are uh, created by Solon, but not only by Solon, they're created by other lawgivers and they're followed uh, throughout uh, many Greek communities uh, before the Persian Wars, and they are associated with the concept of freedom and they are seen as ways of avoiding tyranny. Okay, good. So far, so good. But what's a tyrant? To return to my introduction to this talk, was it a new phenomenon or a new name for a traditional method of ruling? To answer this question, it's best to study the careers of several tyrants, especially that of Pisistratus. Uh, we're going to find that their method of kind of achieving power and maintaining power was virtually identical to that of those uh, in the Homeric poems. First of all, private property is very important. Many archaic tyrants or potential tyrants were wealthy individuals, the Pisistras were able to maintain varying numbers of air armed men and construct temples and buy dedications for the gods. To afford any of these, Pisistras and families must have had access to large amounts of wealth. This wealth came from a number of sources. Pisistras almost certainly owned estates in Attica, itself as his own property, was substantial enough to be noted by Herodotus as being put up for sale during his exile. The Pisistras probably owned property across the river Strymon in northern Greece, as they were able to gather revenue, cremata, from there. Their rule over other regions beyond Attica, such as Sigeum, may also provide income through tithes or private property. The Pisistras also received wealth from friends and supporters. During the second exile, Pisistras received gifts, dotinas, from poles that owed him something. These contributions were probably the fruit of personal and informal connections, as Herodotus uses the noun dotine, uh, in meaning a gift or present, to describe them, and Pisistratus was able to acquire them at his own discretion. Unfortunately, Herodotus only names one of his contributors, Ligdemus, who provided him with men and cremata. The relationship between Pisistratus and Ligdemus appears to have been reciprocal, as Pisistratus would later give him the island of Naxos to rule, further supporting the theory that Pisistratus collected gifts through personal connections. B, the importance of welfare, uh, excuse me, warfare, warfare. 
Military prestige, military success, and the use of violence and armed supporters all continue to be used by tyrants or protective tyrants in their pursuit of power. Before any of the three attempts to become tyrant, Pisistratus already enjoyed the fame and prestige won through his military success against Megara. Uh, uh, Herodotus makes this clear. It's, re it's repeated in the Constitution of the Athenians, although he later added to his reputation by conquering Naxos and Sigeum. The Pisistratus were particularly careful to maintain uh, armed support from various sorts at critical moments. Pisistratus is partic particularly consistent success in this area and only speaks to his accomplishments as a soldier, but also reveals the remarkably diverse practices through which a tyrant could gain military support. Pisistratus acquired a band of armed men, these are called the Kura and Neforoi in Herodotus, through a ruse that he used to seize control of Athens for the first time. Pisistratus was assisted in his third and final coup by Argive soldiers assembled through his marriage to the Argive woman Tumanasa. These are generally called mercenaries by historians later on, but their status as mercenary troops, troops is debatable. It's probably an anachronistic uh, 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 label. The Argives were led by Pisistratus' son, Hegesistratus. Hegesistratus was the son of Pisistratus and Timonassa, suggesting they were allies secured through the ties established through marriage and friendship. The Constitution of the Athenians also mentions armed support from Eretria and Thebes and claims that Pisistratus hired Mistas, Mistosomenos, soldiers from around Pangaeum for his final coup. Pisistratus was able to return to power for the third and final time by defeating the Athenian army at Palini. He obviously had uh, substantial military backing. Once installed in power, Pisistratus continued to cultivate armed support, collecting more soldiers at Picoroi. When in power, Pisistratus and his family successfully pursued conflicts on behalf of Athens. The Pisistratus were later able to call in support from the Sicilians against their enemies. The Sicilians were called Epicoroi by Herodotus. The sources say little about how the Pisistratus built a relationship with the Sicilians, although Pisistratus probably had a son named Thassilus, which suggests a connection, possibly through marriage, but the lack, evidence, lack of evidence prevents meaningful discussion. The attitude of later sources toward Pisistratus soldiers was to view them as mercenaries, uh, but uh, as I say, I think the, uh, it's probably, these are traditional practices. Um, by personal ties. Three, importance of marriage. The practice of marriage was instrumental in securing the power of the Pisistratus and his family. Pisistratus was able to return to power in 557 or 556 on the strength of an alliance with his former rival Megacles through the marriage to Megacles' daughter. In preparation for his third coup, Pisistratus recru recruited Argive warriors through a friendship with the Argives established by his marriage to an Argive woman to Manasseh. For Pisistratus, an influential marriage carried as much military potential as the marriage alliances of the Homeric Basileus. There's total continuity here. Marriage, of course, produced offspring and relatives whose loyalty was relatively secure. Pisistratus and his family made extensive use of their relations in times of need. Like the Basileus, they employed them as counselors, soldiers, public figures, political agents. Several of Pisistratus' descendants held the archonship at Athens. And Herodotus tells us that Pisistratus set up his son, Hegesistratus, as the ruler of Sigeon. So again, here is this, the use of the personal connections actually um, in uh, creating uh, political power. Pisistratus' son, Hippias, continued to use marriage as a political tool, marrying his daughter to Antiochus, the son of Hippocles, tyrant of Lampsicus. So, uh, Thucydides attributes the marriage to Hippocles' desire to secure an overseas refuge and to tap into Hippocles' influence with the Persian king. Marriage and relatives uh, and political connection, connections created continued to be a significant aspect of Pisistratus' pursuit of power. And again, here we have a uh, continuity again with the Homeric period. Uh, number uh, four, religious practice. Pisistratus proceeded into Athens, accompanied by an impersonation of the goddess Athena. It's a famous story, of course, in Herodotus, and his final attempt at seizing power enjoyed the support of a favorable prophetic utterance. Again, the use of montes and predictions and oracles. Pisistratus later followed the command of an oracle by cleansing the island of Delos. And this was very important, again, creating legitimacy for him. During their rule, the Pisistratus took control of all the proper state sacrifices, this is attested in Thucydides, and placed themselves conspicuously in control of the Panathenea, directing and perhaps appearing in the procession. 
Diodorus wrote that the daughter of Pisistratus also took part in the procession. Hippias, grandson of Pisistratus, dedicated the altar of the twelve gods in the marketplace and the altar of Apollo in the Pythium. The Pisistratus also worked in the temple of Olympian Zeus. When Pisistratus and his family carefully observed religious tradition and ensured that religious norms continued to be practiced on behalf of the community when they were in power. They also took a conspicuous part in religious rites, virtually visibly connecting themselves with the favor of the gods and uh, the, consequently the safety and prosperity of the poets. And then number five, payment for protection. Now, we saw in the Homeric poems that it was typical of Homeric leaders to collect gifts, uh, again, uh, from their followers in, in, uh, uh, for payment, actually, uh, for protecting them both from enemies and also for keeping order. Herodotus mentions that once in power for the final time, Pisistratus raised revenue in Attica, and Thucydides in the uh, Constitution of the Athenians state that this was a percentage of tide, a tithe on their produce. They differ a little bit on the percentage, but on the idea that they would kind of collecting uh, this is a common in both sources. It's very similar to the payments of the American kings received from their communities and for maintaining order and defending them against enemies. And then <coughs> six, justice. Uh, the Athenian constitution states that uh, a Pisistratus visited the countryside administering justice. Pisistratus was concerned with maintaining order and administering justice, or at least appearing to uphold justice, developing a reputation for justice and moderation that endured after his death. Pisistratus not only observed the laws, but apparently administered them with great fairness. A story was circulated that he granted tax exemption to a farmer who grumbled about his tithe and appeared in court to face prosecution. Now, uh, this is... Uh, Se non è vero e ben trovato. Uh, these tales are very doubtful. Um, but on the other hand, it, it does show that Pisistratus is trying to at least portray himself as just and moderate. In, in abating this matter, Pisistratus was not doing anything radical. Basiles were expected to uphold the Themistes and DK, this is in the Iliad and also in the Odyssey, and maintaining popular support by doing so. This template manage, uh, matches Herodotus' uh, tale of Deoces' rise to power of the Medes. Deoces abused his reputation uh, as a just man, gaining leverage over the populace who granted him tyrannical power in return for maintaining order. Pisistratus conformed to this practice either by dispensing justice or providing his own traveling judges. Not only would this have brought order, these traveling judges, and stability to Attica, but they would have disrupted the need for Athenians to approach other powerful men to do, uh, settle disputes, such as Pisistratus' old rivals and Lycurgus, while cu cultivating a great deal of popular support for Pisistratus himself. So, we see that in order to take power, we've seen that Pisistratus uses private wealth, military prestige, personal connections, marriage alliances, religious practices, and the administration of justice, just as the leaders in the Homeric poems. Pisistratus' family did not depart from the established practices of the Homeric Basiles, and each of these practices finds precedence in Homer. Even when the, the family took, appointed archon, uh, uh, took an appointed archon in 508, Isagoras um, oh, was set up um, again. Uh, again, there is an attempt to kind of provide a kind of facade, as it were, of respecting constitutional norms, but it's clear that the main power actually resides in these traditional practices inherited from the Homeric period. Now, um, again, the Athenian community, the seventh and sixth century, had the inclination and the means to defend itself. This implies the existence of an archaic prejudice against tyranny and undermines the theory of battling over tyranny was the preserve of the elite. Considering the advice and evidence of Homer, the failed attempts at tyranny at, at, at Athens and the substance of early Greek laws, it's unlikely the archaic community was a passive observer of elite competition, as has been argued by Forsdyke. It was clear that the, um, again, uh, that the, uh, the uh, tyrants, again, had to also not only uh, cultivate uh, popular support, even though uh, they were very much, um, uh, again, uh, gain their power to a large extent uh, by their connections with other uh, uh, leaders uh, again, the community and very wealthy leaders uh, against such as, as a, uh, such as a Megacles. Now, we can now understand the origin of the term tyrant and tyranny. 
When Solon and other Greek lawgivers de developed the idea of the freedom of the community ruled by laws and not by individuals, he needed to contrast this new form of political arrangements with its opposite and to promote the new arrangement by comparing its virtues with the vices of what preceded. If the rule of law was the way the Greeks would now create their political identity, they also needed to create a constitutional other, that's a other with a capital O, an alien form which could be used to justify the ideology and practices of the new form of government. This led to the creation of the stereotype of the tyrant, a sort of constitutional boogeyman who could be used to terrify citizens into accepting the new form of government and discourage them from backsliding to the old forms of political power as found in the Homeric poems. This stereotype took several decades to develop, but by the time of Aeschylus, Sophocles, and Herodotus, the image of the tyrant acquired several distinctive traits that were believed to characterize all those who held absolute power. First, the tyrant is suspicious and always seeing plots to overthrow him. We see this trait in the classic tyrants of Attic tragedy, Cleon in, Creon in the Antigone, and Oedipus in the Oedipus Tyrannos. Secondly, the tyrant relies on paid mercenaries to support his rule. Plato says that tyrants need to hire armed guards to remain in control, and that many of these will be foreigners. And this is also, we find this in Aeschines too. Aristotle draws a distinction between the royal bodyguard and a tyrannical bodyguard. Kings are protected by armed citizens, while tyrants have guards who are foreigners. In Xenophon's dialogue, uh, which Edmund talked about last time, Hero says that a tyrant needs mercenaries because these troops are kept not to maintain equality, but to protect the tyrant's interests. Third, the tyrant does not trust talented advisors who might outshine him, but prefer toadies and flatterers who do not give him good advice. According to Herodotus, the tyrant of Corinth, Periander, sent a messenger to Thrasybulus, the tyrant of Miletus, to ask him what was the best way to rule the city. Thrasybulus led the messenger outside the city and went into a field planted with crops. As he went through the wheat, he cut off the highest ears of wheat he could see until he had destroyed the best part of the crop. He gave the messenger not a word of advice and sent him on his way. When Periander asked the messenger what advice Thrasybulus had given, the messenger replied that he had given him none, but then described what Thrasybulus had done. Periander immediately understood what advice Thrasybulus had given, which was to kill off those who were prominent or talented. And in the debate recounted by Herodotus about the virtues of different constitutions, Otanes denounces tyrants for being jealous of the best men and surrounding themselves with the worst sorts of people. And Plato paints a similar portrait of the tyrant uh, in the Republic, a passage which uh, Edmund talked about last time. According to Plato, the tyrant will get rid of all free-thinking people by handing them to the enemy. He must remove them all who speak freely and the brave. This weakens the regime. Okay, so that's a typical part of the stereotype of the tyrant, um, which then gets uh, handed down and is then again brought into the uh, philosophical tradition. Fourth, the tyrant cannot be trusted and use deceit to obtain his goals. The Athenian Miltiades, who made himself tyrant of the Chersonese, lured the leading men of the area to his house by pretending to be in mourning for the death of his brother Desagoras. When they came to express their sympathy, Miltiades had them all put in chains. Again, a case of trickery. And again, we see also Pisistratus is, is alleged to have used trickery to seize power. Fifth, the tyrant looks only to his own advantage and neglects the good of the community. According to Thucydides, the tyrants in early Greece looked mainly to their own interests and never accomplished anything noteworthy except against their neighbors. And as a result of the rule by tyrants, Greek communities of that age were incapable of common action. This may be a, an exaggeration, uh, but it again, it is absorbed into this idea of the stereotype uh, of the tyrant. Aristotle also makes this point about tyrants in these politics. Sixth, the tyrant is not account accountable and can therefore violate the laws or common values of the community. This results in the exile of opponents, the execution without trial, and the unjust confiscation of property. Okay, um, I've given you uh, a large kind of overview of what I think is the uh, origin, again, uh, of this concept. Uh, just to summarize uh, briefly, one, uh, 
the uh, there are uh, several methods, uh, traditional methods of obtaining power, which we can see in the Homeric poems. Uh, these are replaced by a new set uh, of methods, uh, which are uh, introduced by the archaic lawgivers. Uh, Solon, of course, uh, is the best representative. But these, uh, again, these ideas of decentralizing power uh, through various uh, means, division of function, uh, one only serving in uh, office for a year. Uh, again, uh, magistrates having checks upon one another. Uh, again, also entrenchment clauses, uh, which uh, protect the laws against being changed. Uh, and also the uh, accountability of magistrates. Again, this is a massive kind of a shift in attitudes. Solon then again uh, redefines um, the ideas of uh, eleftheria, freedom, and also dulea. Uh, his new form of the rule of law uh, again is associated with eleftheria, again, freedom for the community as a whole, not just individuals. Of course, it will protect the, the uh, freedom of individuals. But again, uh, the, the idea of Eleftheria uh, is now again projected uh, to the community as a whole. And then again, a tyranny, the old form, uh, is then associated with Dulea, uh, with uh, a slavery. Uh, again, the lack of respect for individual uh, human rights. Uh, and again, uh, the uh, again the tyrants, um, which uh, again we find again in the late archaic period, are not doing anything new. They basically are again continuing the traditional forms of gaining power, uh, which Solon and other uh, Greek law lawgivers now find uh, as a dysfunctional uh, method of uh, a dysfunctional uh, method uh, of ruling. Uh, and then as a result, uh, this dysfunctional method of ruling, uh, which is called uh, tyrannis, or the individuals are called um, uh, tyrannis, is now, uh, again, we kind of create this kind of a stereotype, uh, as it were, a kind of pathology of tyrannical rule, which is associated with several forms. And this pathology of kind of tyrannical rule is going to have a very long history, not only in Greece, but also, uh, again, in Rome. Uh, and we find it, for instance, uh, Demosthenes uh, uses it uh, when he's, again, attacking Philip uh, in his famous speeches, uh, again, of the 340s, which are then, again, taken over uh, by Cicero. And those uh, ideals of Cicero are then taken up uh, in the uh, Italian uh, Renaissance, uh, again, uh, taking up, again, this hostility uh, to tyranny. And then again, of course, uh, they then uh, come down to us today. So again, thank you very much. Um, I'm looking forward to your questions. Um, I've covered a lot of ground, um, and, but I hope that gives you uh, a lot to discuss. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, good, good. Mm -hmm. So can I ask if there are any questions? Uh, uh, questions. If you want to just put your hand up, um, that might be the easiest way. Vir put your hand up virtually. Um, that might be the easiest way to signal it. Um, but while, oh, yes, there is indeed. Um, uh, so it's, uh, apologies if I get the pronunciation wrong. Uh, uh, thank you. Do, do please take the floor. Uh, Professor Harris, thanks very much for the talk. It was very rich and interesting. I appreciate it. I, I had a, just a quick question about your assessment of the new um, institutions or technologies of rule um, with regard to um, annual office holding, um, uh, the Uthunai, and so on. I, in particular, what I was wondering was whether you think the evidence bears out that things like um, accountability for magistrates was something that was new or whether it was something that w was different in that the accountability of magistrates was no longer to the king or tyrant or somebody like that. I, that is, it, there's, we have this notion of the tyrant 
himself is unaccountable. Um, but presumably the magistrates would have been accountable to the tyrant or the traditional uh, a monarch or, or, or what have you. And I was wondering what you think the evidentiary record is with regard to whether these techniques of uh, accountability to political authority were um, new inventions or whether they, they, they in, in, in effect just changed direction such that uh, uh, the, the magistrates were accountable to some other body rather than a, a, a ruler. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for that. Um, I'm not exactly sure. I mean, we don't have this sense of in the Homeric poems, uh, again, and also uh, later, um, say under Pisistratus, uh, to what extent um, they delegated power uh, to uh, subordinates and to what extent those leaders then held those subordinates accountable to the norms of the community. Um, now, there is definitely a sense that the leaders of the community in the Homeric period are uh, not, I don't know if I want to say accountable, but they can, their actions can be evaluated in terms yeah. of certain norms which are superior to them. And the best example of this, of course, is Hesiod, who is complaining about the uh, Basiles, who are uh, Dorophagi, they're eating their Dora, but they're not giving justice in his case again uh, with his brother. Uh, so there is this sense that even though uh, uh, they do have the power um, and there may be no body which is kind of holding them accountable, they therefore are can, their actions can be evaluated by a kind of higher standard. Now, Michael Gagarin uh, has argued that the word decay, again, in the Homeric poems, really just means kind of legal procedure. Um, and that basically, as long as one followed the legal procedure, everything was kind of considered to be kind of okay. But I think Matthew Dickey has, has shown that the word decay really has this sense of kind of justice. And these standards of justice can be used as a way of evaluating uh, the actions, uh, again, of these leaders, even though there's no mechanisms to kind of keep them kind of uh, accountable. Uh, and uh, so I, I'm not sure I'm not sure if I'm exactly uh, addressing your question, but um, in that sense is that there is a sense that the, the leaders can be evaluated in the Homeric poems and the Homer Hesiodic poems according to a kind of superior standard, even though if there's no mechanism to kind of keep them uh, in accordance with those standards. Does that answer the question or are you kind of, or I'm not answering the question? <laughs> well, if I may, just very quickly, I see that there's a, there's a further question in the chat, but the, uh, just to say yeah, the, 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 the thought was that, um, that there may, there may be an important difference between say the, the archai in the ca context of say Athenian democracy, where we have the elaborate uh, uh, institutional uh, accountability mechanisms compared to the ruler in in the strong sense of a um, uh, of a tyrant or king, and that the tyrant or king presumably would have had a range of magistrates, but that would have been accountable to him or his mm -hmm. primary ministers or something like that. And so the question was about whether. We have any evidence at all of those accountability mechanisms to have to, to be able to track whether, say, democratic accountability and so on is is just a, a redirecting of 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 the accountability of magistrates to the the body that has power or authority. That I, I again I don't I wish we knew quite more about the kind of day to day workings of kind of say the 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 regime of the Pisistratids, um, to what extent, uh, you know, what happens if there was a magistrate? And we do know they continued on again with the magistrates again during uh, the period of um, Pisistratids, because we still know they're, they're still, uh, they're still uh, uh, electing archons who were serving uh, for a year. And we have the names of actually several of them. If they, to what extent, if they stepped out of line, uh, how they were disciplined, I, I wish I knew, but unfortunately, I kind of, I don't. If they, if they kind of kept some sort of traditional, 
they sort of, sort of some constitutional mechanisms, or to what extent whether uh, Pisistor has kind of stepped in and disciplined them, I, I, I don't I don't know. If you if you can provide some evidence for that, I'd be very uh, it's, helpful. It's, it's all a black box for me. I thought it might not be for you, but thank you very much. I appreciate it. Sorry about that. Thank you very much for that question. Yes, we have a, a question in the chat, and I should have said do feel free if you'd rather uh, put a short question in the chat, do so. Um, so uh, I'm just going to uh, summarize this question, which is essentially um, why is it if we have this critique of tyranny um, uh, and tyranny as, as a form of despotism over slaves, then why do we not find a stronger critique of slavery in the ancient world uh, or any movement, I presume, uh, a movement to emancipate slaves? Uh, in the ancient world, um, I assume, is meant here. Um, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, it, it, uh, that's an excellent question. I kind of wish I knew who kind of it posed it. Um, sorry, sorry. I can't hear you. Carlos, um, uh, and hang on. Uh, yeah, would you like to introduce yourself, sorry, sir? It just says Carlos. Uh, it's Carlos Carvalho. Uh, my question, uh, uh, sorry if I just left uh, talking. I uh, wrote the question because I know that I have a lot of accent, but uh, I think there is a, like a gap between the critique of uh, tyranny related to the slavery, but uh, it doesn't reach all the people. So they can continue uh, making slaves of Greeks but uh, there is also uh, some discussion that we can get like for Alkidama's phrase that it's just one fragment that says, God has left all men free. Nature has made none a slave. So uh, I think there is some kind of critique of slavery, but it's not a, a, main, a main thing happening in Athens. And I'd like to know why the, this critique of tyranny as a critique of uh, slavery, uh, why didn't reach so far to the critique of slavery for all, because I know there is an economical factor. Athenian democracy is based on, on slavery, but should we use just the economic factor to, to continue to justify the slavery? Um, that, that, that's an excellent question, and I must say I'm very perplexed by it. I'm really happy you raised it. And I must say I gave a talk about a year ago, and I posed the same kind of question, and it's always kind of perplexed me. Because it's very clear that by associating slavery with tyranny, the Greeks realized that the relationship between a master and a slave is a terrible relationship. It's the sort of thing you want to avoid. It's, it's, it, it, is, it includes suffering. I mean, we see this in the Iliad. That was why I wanted to read that entire passage. And it's, uh, it's painful. Uh, and it also uh, is an affront uh, to human dignity. And yet it's implicit in all the work on slavery. Uh, and it's all the work, of course, uh, on, on tyranny. Tyranny is bad because it actually creates a relationship between the ruler and his followers, which is similar to that between the master and the slaves, which is recognizing that that relationship is painful. And yet... They still don't, after seeing this, they don't take what we would think would be is the next step is to say, well, OK, slavery, therefore, is something which should be abolished. And you're rightly that one of the few passages we have in actually is uh, about uh, all men being kind of, you know, born uh, free. But that's a it's an outlier. Uh, it's definitely kind of an outlier. Um and slavery is therefore kind of uh, accepted. And I must say, I'm, I'm perplexed by this. I'm not sure I have uh, an answer um, to your really excellent question. Um, maybe you can uh, come up uh, with uh, an idea of this, but there is this idea that the, the distinction between free and slave is something which is even created by the gods. I mean, there are these several passages which say that, you know, the gods have created a difference between slave and free. And when Aristotle has this famous and very troubling uh, discussion uh, in the politics, 
He does not question the existence of the, uh, of the institution. He tries to come up with a justification for it in terms of his notions of physis. He thinks that it is actually in the in physis. It's in nature. It's in the natural way uh, of things, this distinction between free and slaves. But he sees there, he's intelligent enough to see that there are problems with this, but he's not bold enough to kind of question the entire institution, um, which is, you know, what we would think is that there is still this sense that certain people deserve to be slaves uh, and certain people then deserve to kind of uh, be free. Um, and uh, that's really kind of as far as I can uh, as I can kind of go with it. I, I'm very perplexed by this, and you're really quite right to put your finger on it, okay? I, uh, if you have any further questions, please let me know. No, thank, thank you. you. Um, we have Sam Ellis has a question. Please go ahead. Hi there, Sam. Hi, Professor Harris. Um, haven't seen, I hope you haven't can hear seen me. you in two, haven't seen you in two years. Yes, nice to see you again. Uh, thank you for your paper. Um, I was wondering if there are any kind of noticeable differences in the requirements for accountability for rulers when they kind of exceed the confines of the Greek polis. So if you look at like Thessaly or Sicily, where their power kind of goes beyond the city state, uh, does that kind of impact what requirements of accountability there are? Um, again, I'm. <laughs> Uh, usually, when you have, uh, for instance, the, the Sicilian quote tyrants, uh, again, um, those who were kind of extending their power beyond the bounds of the city state are often kind of accused of being tyrants. To what extent? I mean, Edwin kind of put, started this question last time, which I think is an excellent question. To what extent are the Sicilian tyrants? Uh, do they fit the kind of kind of stereotype uh, or not? Um, and there is the question, of course, once you get in the Hellenistic kings, uh, the uh, kingdoms, uh, these seem to be uh, rulers who are kind of beyond accountability. At least there are no political systems of accountability which are incorporated into the political structure. Um, and this is something which actually kind of, uh, and this is why I think the Athenians uh, again, are so hostile, or at least Demosthenes gets them to be hostile to Philip II and to Alexander, is because they see these as rulers who are beyond accountability. And also, I think Thucydides, uh, Demosthenes, as, I've argued, uh, as I argued in a, in a recent paper, um, sees them as kind of fitting into all the kind of stereotypes of, uh, of the uh, tyrant uh, because there aren't these kind of mechanisms of kind of accountability. And, and Demosthenes says this several times. He's really quite, um, he, he bangs on and on and on about it. Um, and I think this is, again, uh, again, again, one of the big divisions, again, between the Greek city-state, again, and the, and the Hellenistic kingdoms. Um, to what extent? I mean, the Hel on the other hand, the, the Hellenistic kings respond to this concern. Um, and this would be my... My question, my uh, answer to you, is by creating things like the Charter of the League of Corinth. And the Charter of the League of Corinth, they, even though they don't consider themselves accountable, they commit themselves to certain kind of pledges, which are to maintain the rule of law and to, for instance, uh, stop uh, the liberation of slaves, stop uh, the uh, stop the redistribution of property, stop actually even tyranny. Um, and they commit themselves to certain kind of features which are associated with the rule of law in these city states as a way of gaining the confidence of the Greek city states. And these, of course, as you know, I mean, you know more about Hellenistic history, Sam, than I do. Oh, and congratulations on finishing your thesis. I'm very proud of you. Uh, at any rate, uh, as you know, they, these are continued on in the, um, uh, in again, the pledges of the Hellenistic monarchs, again, uh, to the Greek city-states. So they're trying to portray themselves, actually, as committed 
to these ideals, even though they may not be accountable in their own communities. Does that answer your question, Sam? Yes, thank you. Yeah. Great, and we have a question from uh, Jan Kuchaski. Uh, yes, hello. Thank you very much for uh, for your paper. I think I, I personally find the the parallels you drew between uh, Pisistratus and the Homeric Basita is very illuminating. But I just I just have one question, which is which may be a follow up to Sa to Sam's question, which is which does concern the problem of accountability, because the Homeric Basileis were nevertheless accountable in some extent, to some extent, the people. Uh, they were accountable, as you have mentioned yourself, in the fact in that they were supposed to be fighting for them be protecting them, whereas the paradigmatic Tyrannos was not was completely unaccountable. He was like free from all accountability. Anipotinos. Uh, is does I mean do you find any 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 problems with this with this with these two uh, any um, what differences? And that separate these two figures, that is the Homeric Basileus and the Tyrannos, in this respect? Well, I think this gets to a good, you put your finger on a very uh, important point. Um, the one thing I, I stressed is, one, the reality of the techniques which are being used by these individuals who are called Tyrannoi, such as Pisistratus, such as Kipsilus, such as Periander, and also this stereotype of the Tyrannos, which is developed again as a political uh, ideology, uh, which simplifies, like all stereotypes. And I've written an article again uh, on this, uh, published in 2018 in the Festschrift for uh, Miltiades uh, Hatsopoulos, how this kind of develops into a kind of stereotype. And this stereotype is then imposed on people who are then considered to be tyrants, like Philip II. And Demosthenes uses this stereotype to characterize the actions of Philip, but if you actually compare what we know about Philip with this stereotype that Demosthenes is again creating, it's clear that the stereotype, even though there is some overlap, there is also some serious differences, actually. Let me give you one example. For instance, Demosthenes considers Philip a tyrant because he has all his hands, all power in his hands. And to a certain extent, that's in comparison to the Athenian democracy, that's true. And then he says, because he therefore seems to kind of fit, you know, several of the features of the stereotype of the tyrant, he therefore must be completely supported by mercenaries. But anybody who has actually looked at the sources, Diodorus and the other sources, and this is actually by Griffith and by Hatsopoulos, shows that this is not true. This is an assumption on Demosthenes' part. He's imposing a stereotype on Philip because he seems to fit certain aspects of the stereotype, but actually he doesn't fit and so he imposes the other aspects of the stereotype that say he's really in uh, relying on, uh, again, uh, foreign mercenaries. And if you actually look in, he's got his own Macedonian troops. Those are Macedonian troops. Um, and uh, he, it's actually in Demosthenes 19, he also talks about Philip's troops being Xenoi. And we know from everything that we can tell that this is simply not true. He's actually relying on his own Macedonian. So to get back to uh, your point, we have this kind of tension again, between this stereotype, which is created by people who are in favor of the rule of law ideology, and especially Demosthenes. Demosthenes is the, one of the greatest kind of exponents, uh, again, of this, that they then impose on this kind of foreigners whom they know nothing about. One thing it's important to keep in mind, that until Demosthenes went to Macedonia in 346, he had no idea of what the Macedonians were like. He was he, he developed these stereotypes in the Olynthiacs without any direct experience of what they were like. So again, to get back to this point, 
is I think what the stereotype does is that, and it is a good point, because if we look at the Homeric poems, Agamemnon, Agamemnon, there are no formal political practices for accountability. Granted, we agree mm -hmm. on that. But on the other hand, when Agamemnon is gets out of line and seizes, you know, kind of Perseus, or he doesn't give back Perseus, he has to talk to the assembly. And the assembly is clearly not happy with him. And also Nestor actually says, you know, you have violated the uh, basically kind of norms. And Agamemnon, of course, in book nine, and then kind of later, of course, um, uh, in, the, in the poem, then admits that uh, he was wrong. So there is this sense, Egan Agamemnon does have a great deal of power. He's the supreme leader. There is this sense that he is, there are these higher norms that he is accountable to, but the norms operate in a very different way in the Homeric poems than they operate in the city state. Do you see, you see what I mean? I mean, it's, it's, a, mm -hmm. it's a, a long process. I mean, they can't just kind of, you know, kind of put him before Agamemnon before a euthunai and kind of, you know, have, a, have an accuser and uh, send him into a court. It's a long process. It's a very painful process, which then generates, of course, a lot of the tragedy of the uh, of the Iliad. Um, and to a certain extent, um, uh, I think Homer is actually very perceptive about this. So here again is this case where the where the stereotype is exaggerating what was probably the reality, uh, if we consider the Iliad the reality. Um, does that answer your question? Which is yes, a good question. Yes, it does. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. I I'm conscious that uh, it's getting late, both particularly in uh, Athens and also in uh, Poland. But um, uh, we perhaps have one time for, uh, time for one very short question remaining from uh, Harry Platonakis. Um, uh, if you would like to quickly ask that question. Yes, thank you very much, Professor uh, Harris. Uh, can I ask you uh, to say a bit more on uh, the theory comment you made, I, I, I fully see that with reference to democratic policies uh, and uh, uh, the association of uh, isonomia uh, or the uh, use of isonomia as uh, an answer to the tyranny and so on and so forth, all the way from Gregory Blastos nowadays. But what about cases of non-democratic policy? You mentioned Spartan political institutions and practices that are blocking uh, tyranny in a sense. Uh, do we have any evidence of the theoretical background or contextualization of such practices? Yeah, Harry, thank you very much. That's an excellent question. Um, uh, to a certain extent, I, I made some comments about this in my 2006 article, but I will um, then talk to you about it. Uh, first of all, this idea, uh, this distinction between democracies and, quote, aristocracies and oligarchies is something that does not develop until the late uh, fifth century. Uh, in fact, the terms oligarchia and democratia are not attested before 450. Uh, they are, it's a development I've written on this, um, again, the essays on my kind of website, uh, these are, uh, and they are generated, this distinction between democracies and oligarchies, and the struggle between them is really generated by the struggle between Athens and Sparta in the late 5th century, when the Athenians especially are trying to come up with an ideology actually to support their attack on, uh, uh, on Sparta and their resistance of Sparta. Now, the thing is that what people do is because this distinction between democracy and oligarchy slash aristocracy is so important in the late 5th century, especially once you've gone to the 4th century. What tends to be kind of forgotten is that this is not an important distinction in the archaic period. It's not an important distinction in the 6th period. And what people tend to do is they tend to ignore the broad similarities between uh, quite Sparta and Athens and say other, quote, um, well, non-democratic um, regimes, we can't use the word democratia because it really doesn't occur until after uh, uh, 450. 
And these similarities, when I talked about those uh, basic uh, aspects of the rule of law, eunomia. And eunomia is a term which both the Spartans and the Athenians claim to champion. Uh, the Athenian people associate eunomia with aristocratic regimes. That's not really fair because uh, Demosthenes, uh, Demosthenes and especially Aeschines associates, he says, the regime which best promotes eunomia is democracy. It's our system. So Eunomia is not an aristocratic, uh, exclusively aristocratic term. It's a uh, broadly uh, a term. And what uh, Solon is uh, promoting is something which is broadly uh, accepted um, throughout the, quote, constitutional regimes in the sixth century. And even though uh, there's an excellent article by uh, Alberto Esu, uh, again, on the idea of the, uh, the rule of law, and the rule of law, the idea is that motions passed in the assembly should be a subject to some kind of higher norms. We find both in Athens and we find in Sparta in the fifth century, in the fourth century, but the institutional mechanisms are different. So even though the ideas, the concepts are, are the same, um, the institutional mechanisms are slightly uh, different from one regime to the next. And Pierre Froelich, in his excellent book, Le Contrôle des Magistrats, talks about the methods of accountability. And he shows that the principle of accountability is something which we find both in Athens and, quote, democratic regimes, and also in non-democratic regimes, both through the classical period, all through, through the, uh, into the Hellenistic period. But it's done differently in, in quote, non-democratic regimes. It tends to be placed in the hands of one officials or kind of a set of boards. Where is in democratic regimes, it tends to be placed in the hands of kind of courts or uh, kind of larger um, or in a different way. But the principle is the same. The mechanisms for achieving the results intended by the ideal will differ from community to community. Uh, and I highly recommend Alberto Esu's uh, article on this contrasting and uh, comparing actually Athens uh, and Sparta. Does that, does that answer my question, Harry? Yes, thanks very much. I, I, I was referring to isonomia, not to eunomia. But um, uh, yeah. you can follow up on that later. I can send you an yeah, yeah. about that. Uh, isonomia is, is interesting because isonomia means uh, people, uh, there have been some debate about this, so whether it means isonomia is an equal distribution um, to individuals and community. I would say that isonomia, again, going back to uh, Thucydides to uh, book two, uh, chapter 37, is really the sense of equality before the law. And equality before the law uh, can be a principle which is championed not only by democratic regimes, but also by non-democratic regimes. And there's a very important passage uh, in book three, uh, again, of Thucydides, where the Thebans are talking about their regime during the, uh, the Persian Wars. And they said, during the Persian Wars, we had a uh, kind of an oligarchy, which was again, uh, a more kind of a, uh, a kind of a junta as it were. But now we have, even though it's an oligarchy, we have an oligarchia isonomos. So this idea of isonomia, equality for the law, can be something which can be found. Again, the institutional mechanisms are different, but the ideal can be shared actually between democratic regimes and also some non-democratic regimes. My problem here is a this comes into a recent book of um, Matt Simonton uh, on uh, oligarchies, uh, which is very interesting um, and it's worth reading. But I think the main problem is with uh, Simonton's book is he doesn't make a distinction between different types of oligarchies. Uh, and there's some which are narrow oligarchies and there are other uh, oligarchies which are like Sparta. And he, even, he actually uh, at one point admits that Sparta doesn't fit into his uh, kind of criteria where I think there is uh, an attempt again to uh, achieve the rule of law and also uh, accountability, even though they do it in a very different way. The accountability is before the council as opposed to before uh, a, a popular court. Uh, and we know, I mean, in, in Sparta, I mean, there, just as in Athens, there are a lot of trials of generals. In Sparta, there are several trials uh, of kings, uh, but the institutional mechanisms are a little bit different. Does that, does that answer your question, Harry? Yes, thank you. Brilliant. Well, 
thank you very much. I think we, we, we all uh, need to thank uh, Edward for a characteristically uh, highly stimulating paper. I think we can see that uh, simply by the, it's always a good sign when the chair uh, never has to ask a question. <laughs> uh, uh, a, a really stimulating and interesting discussion. And I think it is a paper which really uh, sets the background for the archaic period um, for Sorry, you're frozen it, Edwin. Uh, on on this subject. So thank you very much. Um, yes, th thank you. Thank you again, Edward, for, for the fascinating lecture. Thank you, Edmund, for chairing the, the meeting. And I, I want to end by by inviting you to the next uh, lecture, which, which will take place on the 7th of December. And we will host uh, James Kirstead from Victoria University of Wellington, and he will be speaking about this time about freedom of speech, how fine a thing, Isagoria, state performance and democratic dignity. So I will be sending the, the link and the invitation to this lecture as well. And the video will be available on the YouTube channel of the Faculty of Polish and Classical Philology. So I will send a link to, to all of you as well. So thank you again, Professor yeah. Harris and, and everyone and thank you. See you. I hope see you next time. Thank you very much, Edmund and Matthews. And also, thank you for the invitation. And thank you for the just, thank you also for the for the for the excellent questions and the discussion. It was very helpful. Thank you all, and, and uh, good night to everyone, or indeed good morning. Good Goodbye.